Pastor Steve Gammon and I have a really long track, track record. He knew me, oh my goodness, when? <laughs> and I am really honored uh, to have uh, Pastor Steve here today. Um, before I get started, I, I did want to say pa Pastor Steve was there at a time when I well, I, I, I kind of knew Jesus through incredibly foggy uh, mindsets and just a lot of bondage. And he was he was ministered to me in ways that he, I don't think fully knows, and that's uh, great, but um, at, a, at a very vulnerable time. I honestly probably would not have gotten married or may have backed out of getting married or may have gotten condemned for getting married my husband had it not been for wise counsel from Pastor Steve. So it's a story and I don't want to make it about me, but that's how instrumental Pastor Steve is. So I'm choked up and so happy to introduce you to Pastor Steve Gammon. So. Thank you, Catherine. You just blessed my socks off telling me that story because we often don't know the influence that we have on others. Right. And at the time, I don't think I could have told you I was in so much bondage, but um, you know, sometimes you're in bondage and you don't even know you're in as much bondage as you think you are. So it's whatever it is, but thank you. And you just, it was seamless. So um, very personal thing. Now um, I'm going to go ahead and read your, 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 a little micro bio. He gave me the full bio. Oh my goodness. It's, it's like a who's who of what it's like amazing, but I'm going to read you the short one. So Steve will get a chance to talk. So Stephen will get a chance to talk. So uh, Stephen Gammon is a third generation minister who has walked with God since early childhood, a pastor for 40 years. That's amazing right there. Wherever and whenever God has led him, he has served in three local church pastorates as a denominational leader of ministers and churches, conservative congregational Christian conference, and as an active duty and Navy reserve chaplain. This next part touches me. He has walked with God on beautiful mountaintops and through deep and painful valleys, including personal loss and the hard struggle of enduring cancer. He loves sharing the joy and lessons learned from walking with God through it all. Steve and his wife, Helen, oh, hi, Helen, um, now reside in Northfield, Minnesota. They have three adult children and four grandsons. Um, so little, little micro thing about Steve, uh, and I know that you have so much to share, but welcome. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you, Catherine. It is such a joy to be here, and I thank our Father in Heaven for connecting us after all these years. Thank and uh, yeah, you know, I have so much to share because in the testimony you just shared, you know, walking with God for six decades, I mean, how can you top that? That oh, wow! At, at, at whatever point we come to faith in the Lord Jesus, uh, it is grace. Yeah. I mean, think of the thief on the cross. How much time did he have to know the Lord? Right. But he knew who to look to, didn't he? Oh my goodness! It's all about that. It's all about all about that. He turned it face to the Savior who was hanging right there. And the Lord said to him, his first convert, today you'll be with me in paradise. My father-in-law, who is in heaven now, he came to know the Lord Jesus in, like in his 50s. And he said to me, Stephen, I so wish I came to know the Lord Jesus when I was a boy like you did. And I said to him, ah, at whatever point, it is grace. And I thank God that now you come to know the Lord. Well, yeah. so anyway, I came to know the Lord when I was a child. And as was mentioned, my father, God bless him, he was a pastor. My parents had six children in six and a half years. <laughs> at one point, they had six teenagers, six teenagers at once. Oh, my goodness. So anyway, when we were children, after breakfast every morning, we'd sit around that big round table my dad made. And after feeding physically, we would feed spiritually. Wow. We opened the word of God together. We would have, we would share in a devotional thought together. We would sing songs of worship together. We would pray 
together wow. and everyone would take their turns. And so to me, that was normal. Like I'd have a friend over to visit or whatever and they would like, I've never seen this before. And I was like, really? <laughs> wow, that's, I mean, wow. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, woo, that 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 was not in my wheelhouse, I'll guarantee you. But I that's right. yeah. it's gorgeous, right? It's gorgeous. It's it's the, the beauty of what happened for me was the Lord Jesus Christ, our Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit, God Almighty was as real to me as anyone else who yeah. was in our home. Beautiful. It was that real to me. And so as a little boy, I realized that. Jesus is real. He's here in my home. He's here in my heart. He hears me when I pray. I can turn to him right now. When I'm scared, I can get on my knees and he will hear me. When I, you know, and I had time of sickness as a child. I remember being in the hospital. I was thinking about it. Uh, I was thinking about that this week, actually, because I was reliving some of the fears I had then. I was there in the hospital in this big child, children's ward, scared to death. Mom and dad weren't there. And I was That's sick. Scary. And my yeah. father in heaven says, yeah, but I'm still here. Mm. And it was just like he calmed me right down. Oh. Because even then he was saying to this little child, I got you. Mm. I'm with you. Mm. And, uh, and I guess the point I guess a theme of my life that I that I want to share with your with your viewers, with your hearers, and I know that is dear to you is that we can live in personal relationship with the Father. In fact, this is what God designed us for. Yeah, He's love. And at whatever, yeah, whatever point we come to faith in the Lord, you start there, and then you run with it for the rest of your life. Because it's an eternal promise. Right. Run with it for eternity, right? That we grow, it's, right, in our it's, lives. It's yeah. For eternity. Mm. And so, uh, you know, a couple of passages that come to mind is, you know, Paul, uh, the Lord said to, to, to Jeremiah uh, in the first chapter, I think it's the fifth, the fifth verse, he said, Before I formed you in the womb, oh, my goodness, you. yes. Before you were born, yeah. I consecrated you. And, and Paul said a similar theme in the first chapter of Ephesians. He said that God chose us in him that is in Christ. Oh, my goodness. A long time ago. Right, right. Before the foundation, before the of, the foundation world. of the Jesus world. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And he said in love, he predestined us for adoption as his children according to the purpose of his will so a theme of my life has been the joy of walking with god in personal relationship with him mm -hmm. that's um, real right it's you know, real. sometimes we talk about it in the church and not so sure that it's experientially real for people but man it's it's so and i'm not i'm not questioning everybody's uh, thing but i think no, this is real. It's real, right? You're... It is real. Mm -hmm. It is real. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, there are some who will affirm. In fact, the history of humanity is, the history of humanity is we have affirmed that there is some deity out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, uh, you know, the history of, there's no archaeological or uh, anthropological studies that's ever found a culture that's been devoid of some sort of religious faith. Right. Because why is that? That's the way we're made. We are made to know God and we're made to be, but, and there are many who believe in God, but their fear, but their relations, their, their religion is based on fear, not on love Thank and you. relationship. Yes. Yes. That's my whole that's my whole kind of mandate is, is God is love, knowing God is love and that, and basing your whole existence on that, because that's who he is. That's who you're in relationship with. That's, that's amazing. I, wow. I, what a, what a testimony to being brought up for, as a little boy, even so much so that you're in the hospital and you are terrified and your father says, I, I'm here. You're like, 
right? And the, and the beauty of it is 67 years later, well, no, I wasn't going to be, I'm, I'm about to turn 67. So all these years later, my father is still saying the same message. Right? <laughs> Well, but we need it. the same message, right? We need the same message, no matter what <laughs> age, no matter what age we are. Yeah. And, you know, so let's go back to the dawn of history just for a moment, because our first parents, Adam and Eve, were created and lived in personal, right, mm. close, intimate relationship mm. with our Father in heaven. Mm. Then they did what we would have done and what we have done right they sinned right and the consequence of that was separation mm -hmm. but yet god still in grace invites us to walk with him i love there's two people in genesis that i love they're my heroes genesis 5 24 refers to enoch it just summarizes his life yes <laughs> that's so good what an epitaph enoch walked with god it's so good. Then he was not. Right. Exactly. For God took him. Oh, my God. Yeah. And then it says in the next chapter, the same thing concerning Noah. Genesis 6, 9, it, it says of his epitaph, he walked with God. Now, that was in contrast. In Noah's case, it was in contrast with everybody else. Right. Right. But he walked with God. And that's the invitation that God extends to us. Few people do it. Few people did it then, and few people do it now. Few in terms of the general population. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the same. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. Right. Many are on it. The path that leads to life is narrow. Few seem to find it, but yet He invites us to find it, and that's the gospel, isn't it? And He saw yes, and He's relentless in awakening us to find it like because we're so blind and and so you know he's relentless in his pursuit i know for me um before i met you and before i was saved and all that um you know um i i had had encounters with the lord in, in very deep places that i really think kind of maintained my sanity during times of trauma and um and so i i knew him in a way um, and, um, and, and then when we were trapped, we didn't, we were, we were a secular humanistic home and Christianity was looked down on, but when we were traveling, we'd visit these cathedrals and I'd see these crucifixes and I knew nothing about the gospel. I knew nothing. I would sneak read my Bible and feel ashamed because it was looked down on in my family, but I'd see this man on the cross and I'm like, that's the man. And the only thing I knew is that he loved me and I loved him. That's the only thing I knew. And that's what actually kept my sanity. And later on, when I started spinning out and rebelling against the Lord, because I was so angry because of the consequences mm -hmm. of all the choices people made that were, I had no control over. Um, you know, um, there was this relentless pursuit. I've got a chapter in my book called annoying, relentless love. It would just relentless, relentless, relentless. Yeah. relentless. Yeah. That's how God is like we're made for this. And it's it's hard to resist love forever. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Because it's yes. that. He's not there to condemn. He's not there. He's there to relate with his beloved kids who are just confused and in darkness and blind, you know. Um and yes. that's what yes. we that's yes, it. and I, I wholly concur and, and I, I believe that that the beginning of experiencing that relentless love is hearing that God is actually personally calling our name and extending this invitation. You. He says us by name, and he says, I want you to follow me. Yes. yes. And so it goes up. So you see that when Jesus appears on the scene and begins to you know, he brings the power, the infinite power of the uh, infinite God incarnate in the flesh here with us now. God with us saying, follow me. And I love the fact, you know, like you read the gospel accounts because God wants every one of us to hear the same invitation and to make the same answer as you know, Simon and Andrew and James and John and Matthew, the tax collector and others who he came to them 
totally shocked them because he spoke to them and he said, I want you to follow me. Right. And, and those who did, <laughs> glory to God. I mean, their lives were transformed. They got to live their life following and in personal relationship with the living God. That is the life I've been blessed to live. Now, I told you I was raised in a Christian home and I was. But even though I heard that invitation as a little child, I will tell you and I will tell all of those who hear this, and you know it, I think we all know it. We have to keep hearing this call from the Lord to follow me. Right. We have to keep saying, I'm in. <laughs> right, right. I'm following you in this day, in this situation, I'm going to follow you. Mm -hmm. uh, now, where that a little bit more of my testimony is happened when I was 19. Now, I, I was raised in that Christian home where I believed in Jesus. He was real in my life. I never once doubted it. Never once doubted his reality. I know that's grace. But yet, taking that reality and transforming it to yielding to the lordship of Jesus Christ, the lordship of Jesus, this is an entirely different matter. Right. Follow me means I'm Lord and you're not. <laughs> And he's smarter than we are. It's, yeah. <laughs> so it's oh, in so our best over. interest. Yes. Yeah. So I was a young teenager and I didn't know that. And it hadn't connected with my soul yet mm -hmm. because we're slow learners sometimes. Okay. And so I'm making decisions for my life without really understanding oh, what it means yes. to yes. ask him, what do you say? Mm -hmm. And so this happened just before my sophomore year. I was, you know, about to start my sophomore year at the University of Vermont. Saturday night, because I had taken on a part time, in addition to working at the grocery store in town, and I was cleaning the floors at the, at the church. Uh, so it was Saturday. And, oh, I haven't done that yet. So I'm down there at the church. I'm dry mopping the, the hardwood floors, of the sanctuary of the church that my dad actually served. He was gone that weekend, though. And suddenly, that Saturday night, I can't even put it into words, but I knew the glory of God is in this house. I couldn't stand. I could not stand. I fell prostrate before the Lord, and I could not move. I couldn't move. Some have said, we have used the word slain in the spirit. I don't know what words to use. All I know is God was in the house. And I knew wow. it. Just verbal. And I couldn't move. <laughs> as long as it's God. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. right. And so I heard him say, was it audible? I don't know. It was as powerful as it was. I think it was audible. Mm -hmm. But it was that. very real. Mm -hmm. And I heard mm -hmm. my Lord say, Steve Gammon, who's going to be Lord? your life you were made <laughs> all i can tell you is that's what i needed to hear because the answer was obvious and life-changing yeah oh that's so good and and it's this it's it's this benign it's <laughs> yielding to the one who adores you who loves you so much that he's saying i really know better than you in your own mind yeah. And Absolutely. Your, and your own brilliance and your own understanding and what you think you know about me, right? And your own theology. I know better. You know, the word of God says the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. So it's his spirit. Amen. Right. Amen. So that means he's Lord. Oh, yay. Oh, my God. Please lead me. I, if I, where it's not, <laughs> if I leave, it's going to be bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, to, and, and, <laughs> and he promised to lead us but it dawned on me in that holy moment mm -hmm. he wants to lead me he will lead me mm -hmm. he's going to lead me and i wanted him to and so i got up from that place from the floor a changed man i was 19 years of old i was not the same man as the one that fell <laughs> wow because now my life belonged to the lord and he was going to direct my steps and i was going to go and so this the hymn that i sang was an old i don't know what Hymn, it was an old hymnal song, but I knew it and I sang it. And I have reflected on it through the years. 
It may not be on the mountain height or over the stormy sea. It may not be on the battlefront, my Lord will have need of me. But if by a still small voice he calls the paths I do not know, I'll answer, dear Lord, with my hand in thine. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, or mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. And there are other verses, but the bottom line is, dear Lord, I'm not. I'm in. Let's go. And I love that so, because he doesn't just <laughs> lead you like, okay, like a commander. He's leading you hand in hand, right? Yeah. In that. That's beautiful. Yeah, right? so a couple of weeks later, I'm at the University of Vermont. I was then in pre-med, pre-dentistry, same courses, you know, science, physics, math, all that. And I'm loving it and I'm doing it. But what I'm really loving is I get a group of young guys around me and I'm discipling them. I'm teaching them the Bible. The Bible has just come alive to me. And so after eight or 10 weeks of this, one week after one of the studies, all the guys in this group that I pulled together and I was teaching said, Steve, we got something we want to say to you. Oh, what is it? We are all in agreement that what you are doing with us is what God wants you to do with your life. Oh, you need to, you need to go someplace to prepare for this. That, and it was like, that's funny. <laughs> Oh, Stephen, that is so funny because when I went into medicine, same thing, I didn't ask the Lord, but it was a way that I was propping up my value um, because I felt like I had none and it was a way, and I, I was good at it, but it wasn't what I was supposed to be. And then the Lord called me in ministry. So somewhere, I had no idea. Now, you were you raised in Vermont? Was that where you were? Well, raised? at that time, my dad, well, I was raised in Maine my first 14 years of life. And then my dad moved us to Vermont like three days before I started high school. Yeah. So I finished my high school years there and, and so yeah, on. We're, we're in Vermont because I was, I was born in Vermont. We used to live, you know, I know all about Vermont. Fairhaven, Fairhaven. It's Fairhaven. just uh, Fairhaven. west of Rutland yes. on the New York State, New York State line. Uh, both of my brothers, by the way, went to the University of Vermont Medical yeah. School. So. Boy, so many things. Who knew? <laughs> and we've been, you know, friends for years. Okay, sorry. Is I that where you went to medical that. school? I didn't know that. No, okay. no, no. I know I went to medical school in New Hampshire. I went to Dartmouth, and then I went to oh, in, Dartmouth. in Rhode Island. So, but all on the okay. East Coast. But I was born in Vermont, and uh, my grandparents were in Vermont, and I we used. Yeah. To so anyway all of that so yeah everything's so squashed together there like you cross borders like you know <laughs> left yeah. and right in that so anyway okay so sorry so to I, I went on and, this and is like I had no idea yeah so so praise God I mean, it's such a life I've lived that I went okay so I went down to I went to Barrington College which was a Christian liberal arts college in Barrington I majored in biblical studies and met my wife there uh, we got married in, uh, in, uh, in 1976. Uh, what a blessed year that was. She graduated a year before I did. So we finished college, and then went off to seminary. Out here in Minnesota is where I currently live. And then we came back to Rhode Island. I was serving the church, and I loved it. Uh, I will tell you that when I was a boy, there was no way I wanted to be a pastor. It is not something one aspires to if you want money in your wallet. Oh, <laughs> not generally, no. <laughs> and, and it's like living in a fishbowl in some respects because of what, 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 for many that's, reasons. Oh my God, that's that's, that's got to be a call. Yes. It's got to be a call. And so, uh, but when I was eight years old, going back to Jeremiah, where the Lord said to Jeremiah, even before you were in the womb, I had consecrated you. I remember this sweet little old lady tussling my hair one day. Stephen, look at me. God's hands on your life. You are going to be a pastor someday. <laughs> <laughs> and my brothers go, you know, oh, but anyway. <laughs> But anyway, oh, the point is, is that, you know, such things, if, 
if we could see what the future holds, some of it would scare us half to death. Exactly. Others of it would motivate us with great excitement. Yes. Uh, the thing that allows us to handle it is that we are walking in relationship with a living God who gives us what we need when we need it. Yes. That's, Corey yeah. Ten Boom made that point. I love Corey Ten Boom. If any of you don't know her, go ahead and move. She's an amazing saint of God. But uh, she talked about how she told the story about her papa. I love the fact that Catherine refers to God as Papa because it's that it's it's that enduring endearing term uh, that we have with our God. She talked about how, you know, getting on the train, traveling with her Papa, uh, she would always ask, "Papa, can I have the ticket?" And he said he would never give it to me until we were ready to board the train. Wow! wow. He wouldn't give me he wouldn't give me now what I'm going to need later. He would give it to me. When I, when I need it. Because that my, requires relationship. <laughs> that requires trust. Yes. That you're, and dependency, right? And relational, relational dependency on God right now for this moment in this situation. Mm -hmm. So I pastored for nine years. And then the Lord led me into the Navy, which totally surprised me, uh, you know, because we go where the Lord sends us. I think part of his reason for me was unlike you and many others who live much of life in much of our early life in a, in a shall we say a secular culture <laughs> having lived having lived in the holy huddle yes <laughs> as right. i had mm -hmm. my father lovingly knew i needed to get kicked out of the nest mm -hmm. and he kicked me out of the nest into military life where the vast majority of people whom i was serving were reflections of the rest of culture and they were not right. You know, right. mm -hmm. but they needed the gospel too, and I needed to live it, and I needed to be able to make it relevant and real. And anyway, it was a, it was a, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, so I served, I served my my story. I served active duty for uh, seven years. Mm -hmm. It's first on on board ship, then with infantry marines, and at Naval Submarine School. I was promoted. I was penciled in now to go to an aircraft carrier. Uh, Helen and I, now we're in 1996, we said, what's your plan, Lord? Again, who's Lord? He's not, uh, he is, I'm not. Uh, you know, so I could have made a full career on active duty, uh, but the question is, what are you saying, Lord? My heart was always drawn back to local church life. Anyway, he released us and went back to local church life, stayed in the reserves. And we all remember what happened on September 11, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. 2001. Oh, boy, yeah. Among other things, that changed the definition of serving in the reserves. Oh. Uh, and so I was recalled to active duty again a couple weeks later. Uh, no warning. Um, and so I did that year in active duty came back to my church, to my family. Uh, the following year, now we're in 2003, uh, the denomination that they served was looking for a person to serve in national leadership and uh, came and asked if I'd be willing, if I'd be willing to consider it. And I didn't want to, but because they prayed and because Jesus is Lord and I'm not, I have learned in life, you don't say no if the Lord's saying, I never want to do with Jonah. <laughs> I know, right? It doesn't work. It doesn't work well. <laughs> it doesn't work well. So because Jonah scared me, I ended up ultimately discerning the Holy Spirit was calling me to do it. So I did it. And uh, I answered that call. And uh, so I served that eight years. And during those eight years, from 2003 to 2011, I was traveling a lot, speaking in churches, sometimes pastors' conferences, different things. And I, through those years, kept, you know, because I'm a storyteller. By the way, every Christian has a testimony to tell. And sometimes we think it's stories that we say with them. It's our life. Our life is a testimony of who God is, of how his grace has been revealed in our lives. And 
if you you're a follower of Jesus and you are your story, Catherine, is amazing. And you've said mine is amazing. Well, I think we're all amazing testimonies. Sure. <laughs> Yes. I mean, isn't that amazing? I mean, everybody watching, your story is amazing. And it, and it, it's still being told. It is still being told. It's still being told. By the way, Billy Graham wrote a book, I think when he was uh, 96, uh, where that was about, essentially about finishing well. Oh. And I read that book at that time. And it was, and it was like, as long as you have breath, as long as you have breath, God's got a job for you to do. You keep serving him where he's planted you with what you can do. Yes, that'll preach. That'll Thank preach. You, yes. That'll preach. So anyway, I did, during those eight years, uh, I essentially was shepherding and serving other pastors and churches. And I was speaking Heather and Yon and people, different folks would say, you know, Steve, you really should write some of the stories you're telling you should tell the story for the glory of god and i'm like who's got time well god gave me time in 2011 because i'm minding my own business and in the in the trip by the way this is god's grace we all need to pray right we need to live a life of prayer yes. god gave me a house here when i was called to serve as conference minister of the four seas and I asked God, how can I possibly do this job? Because I knew I was in over my head. Right. The needs of the churches were too great. Mm. The needs of the pastors were too great. I felt so inadequate mm -hmm. when the responsibilities laid before me. I said, God, how can I do this? And God said, and Helen and I prayed together. And the only one of our kids left was Jonathan, who then was 15. The others had fallen to Coop already. So we come out here to Minnesota to look for a home. And while my, my son and my wife were out looking, I was spending time with a guy who might be relieving. And he was giving me the picture of what I was getting into. And I was feeling overwhelmed. So we go look at this house. And it's for sale by owner. We walk inside the door and we're praying, we're, we're praying, I'm praying up a storm and it's filled with worship music. <laughs> And I'm like, ah, oh, the peace of God rests on me. And I make my way down to the lowest level. I see these two bifold doors. What's this? And I go over and I open the bifold doors and I am standing, no fooling. I'm standing in a chapel. Oh. I'm standing in a prayer chapel. Oh. And the Holy Spirit answered my question at that moment. I'm answering your question, Stephen. How can you do it? If you will pray, I'll make a way. Wow. And my son, 15-year-old son, came up, put his hand on my shoulder. Then behind me, he says, Dad, this is it. This is for you. <laughs> right. So anyway, uh, I get called to, uh, in 2011, after eight years, and I'm spending a day in that prayer ch chapter chapel and I'm fasting and praying and I sense the Holy Spirit saying to me stand by you're about to receive new orders mm -hmm. uh, and by the way he's Lord and he and he gives orders to his children and using military imagery you don't argue <laughs> if you try it you'll regret it <laughs> no it doesn't, doesn't go well <laughs> so yes <laughs> so, yes so I found out the next morning what it was about. I get a call back. Another call. You were called back to duty. Because all this time I'd still been serving in, wow. in the reserves. So it was to be a one-year recall. You need leaders, you need uh, stability and leadership roles like I was in. So I resigned my civilian leadership role, trusting the sovereignty of God that he would continue to lead. That one year on active duty became five and a half years. Uh, different places I was led, two places on the West Coast. Uh, I was led to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, so there, there, then then Paris Island, South Carolina, where we make Marines, I was two years there. But the point is during that time, I had time to write, so I ended up writing a book and essentially was uh, 
It was Walking with God, 101 Lessons uh, for Life and Ministry. It was published in 2014, and I had the time because during my off hours while I was on active duty, when my family wasn't with me, I had time to do it. Is that one? So, of, can I just interrupt you a second? Is that one of the ones that's the because uh, uh, Pastor Steve uh, has uh, two books. He's got three books, and two of those are available for free download on Amazon. And I will include those links. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, the, the first one, the one that I was mentioning, is this. Yes. You can see it. Yeah. So Walking with God. And that is available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's available for Amazon and, and other distributors as well. It is available for ebook, but that one there is not free ebook download. Uh, the other two are. So uh, 20, 2016, I retired uh, from the Navy and I'm 61 years old. Churches generally aren't looking for pastors uh, in their 60s, but God knows where he wanted me. Yeah. And I was called to a church in Rhode Island, back where Helen and I started it all. And oh, was, my goodness. And I utterly, utterly loved it. I just, I just loved it. I was where I wanted to be. I was loving the local church life again. But then now I'm going to start hitting where the rubber hits the road, where the pain starts coming. And not there had been a lot of other pain, by the way, up to that point in life. Helen and I lost two children when we were young. Oh, yeah. uh, just, there's just a lot of pain in life because we live in a broken world. But here's the good news. Yes. We're not in it alone. Yes. And we know who to lean on. Wow. Well. Yeah. So I'm two years into this church pastoring, and in 2018, I'm sick. And I actually had recently been in the hospital, very, very sick with bacterial infection in my blood. And uh, so in October of 2018, uh, Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston tell, told me that I had multiple myeloma. Mm. Uh, multiple myeloma is cancer of blood plasma cells, which uh, give us the ability to fight off infection. Right. Uh, typically, in your in your bone marrow, most of us, two to three percent of your in the bone marrow is plasma, maybe as high as five percent. They said, "Sir, yours is eighty uh, percent." Malignant uh, plasma cells had essentially taken over my uh, immune system and destroyed it, and so it was no longer safe for me to be out and about. And I couldn't serve as a pastor anymore. Right. And so it wasn't like something I could plan to retire. It was there. It's wow. done. It's over. Wow. Now. And I had to start cancer treatment. So as you're the image, loss of this way of life that you love, right? And you're starting. It was. Yeah, I just it was, imagine. It was awful for me. And all of the preaching and the lessons that I had lived and taught all my life, I was now being challenged. Do you still believe it? <laughs> Boy, I tell you, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. and are you going to live it now? And so, I mean, because I had walked with a lot of people through the years who were dealing with loss like this, who were dealing with cancer, who were dealing with every, um, almost every imaginable tragedy. It seems like I'd walked with somebody who had dealt with it. And, you know, as a pastor and as a military chaplain, and now I'm dealing with cancer. And so it was the phrase that came to mind was the, a deep valley. David says in Psalm 23, hey, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death. You know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. You know, and sometimes church, brothers and sisters in Christ, we walk through deep, dark valleys. Yeah. But the good news is, David knew it, we knew it, and I have been living it. I'm with you. Jesus, Jesus made that promise. So this was for me a very deep valley because I'd lost so much. I'd lost all this. I'd lost my health. I'd lost my church, I lost 
my passion. I'd lost my livelihood. I'd lost opportunities to do what I was called to do and what I loved to do, which included teaching and preaching and shepherding the flock of God. Suddenly gone, not to mention I was sick and I had lost my energy, but I had not lost the Lord. I had not lost my love for the Lord. I had not lost the promises of God. And I knew in faith that even now, even through this, God is faithful to his promises. And even now God is with me. Yes. And I know many of you have learned, I know Catherine, you've learned this lesson and, and there may be some hearing this who are hearing it or experiencing it big time. I hear all the time from people who are walking through deep valleys. And one of the reasons I hear all the time is because I ended up writing another book on this theme. What happened was I started hearing from all these people wanting updates. How you doing? What's the latest? And you know, it just got tiring and I couldn't do it anymore. So I heard all the different replies. So I heard of this website called Caring Bridge. Maybe some of you have heard yes. of it. Maybe. Have you heard? Yes. No, I know this because of my mom and she was, she, she passed with AML, but um, so um, yeah, no, I'm familiar with Caring Bridge. So it's a yeah, good website. It is. And so basically for anyone who doesn't know, they offer a page to anybody who's sick or to a loved one who can provide that information for you. And essentially you can provide updates there. And so anyone who wants to know how you're doing, Right. They can go to that website. To go. Right. You got one place to go and one place to, to provide the information. So I did that. And uh, because I'm a pastor teacher at heart, when I would, when I'd report in on what I'm doing, I can't help it. Not only that I share his the latest medically, but this is what I'm hearing my God saying, uh, you know, saying through all this. And over time, I began to hear from a lot of different folks, you know, what? That is blessing me. That is speaking to me. <laughs> and so uh, then different folks began to say, you know, we really think you should publish this. You should put up, you <laughs> should work on getting this thing published. So out of that came somewhere, here it is, this one, which is very personal and very powerful to me. It's uh, walking with God uh, yes. through deep valleys lessons on finding contentment when life is hard wow uh, and, and so let's own it for free download i'll have the link yep that one there you can download by the way uh, i was asked i was asked last year i think it was to speak at a at a conference down in south africa and to do it they they were not meeting because of covid and so uh, to speak a video message that would then all the churches would watch because I've spoken and ministered down there before. And so I spoke on this particular theme about how do you find contentment when life is hard. Right. And, uh, and then I told them, I mentioned that uh, this book is available for free download. I think the book had just come out after I did this. And all of a sudden, like 4,000 downloads out of like, oh, I mean, wow. just <laughs> so anyway my point is is that no matter where you are in life if you're a follower of jesus you're yeah. going to have times when when life is hard and so there have been a number of uh of key lessons if i could just maybe uh, hit on a couple of them that are very important very very important uh one is this and that is that biblical contentment is not based on our circumstances it's true. Period. It's true. Biblical contentment is not based on a circumstance. A lot of times we think, you know what? And, you know, fill in the blank. When such and such happens, then I'll be content. You know, when such and such happens, when these fin this financial situation improves, or if you're younger, when I get into such and such a college, or if I get such and such a job, or if I get such and such a report from my doctor or whatever it is, when such and such happens, mm -hmm. then I am going to be content. The problem is if, if you keep living that living life that way, there will always be something 
that isn't there yet because we live in a broken and fallen world. We do. And this is why Paul could write, I think this is my favorite letter that he wrote. All of his letters are powerful to me, but the letter of his epistle to the Philippians. He writes this epistle from a prison cell. I know, right? He didn't want to be there. He didn't deserve to be there. He didn't like being there, but the theme of this letter, a theme of this letter is joy. <laughs> that is supernatural. It is supernatural. And he wrote this in Philippians 4. He says, I have learned. Wow. He had a lot of time to reflect on it. I have learned. Wow. We can learn this. I have learned. Right. It's not like it suddenly came to me. It's like I have learned it. And the only way to learn this lesson is to go through struggles. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned, he said, the secret. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then he tells us the secret, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is about relationship with Jesus Christ. Contentment is found in relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to find our relation. Our com we have to find our contentment in that relationship, not circumstance based. Mm -hmm. I have learned that one, and I knew it already. But going through the deep valley of dealing with the cancer and all of the other ramifications of it, I have learned it afresh. And yes, I'm still learning it. Mm 